Okay, last time I talked to you about a set of disorders observed clinically, um, the disorders traditionally associated with the term hysteria, that while rare, um, seem to display uh, very interesting, provocative disruptions of consciousness. In the dissociative disorders, like hysterical amnesia, psychogenic amnesia, dissociative identity disorder, People seem not to be aware of aspects of their own memories, autobiographical memories or um, self-knowledge that they ought to be aware of. In the so-called conversion disorders, like psychogenic deafness, psychogenic blindness, so-called hysterical anesthesia, people seem not to be aware of sensations and percepts that they ought to be aware of. These hysterical disorders have fascinated clinicians and researchers for more than 100 years now, but it turns out that as fascinating as they are, they're also extraordinarily rare. It's very difficult, very unusual to see them in the clinic, and even when you see them in the clinic, it's very difficult to study them under controlled, uh, under controlled conditions, um, which is one reason, but only one reason, why researchers have been interested in another phenomenon that's been around for a while, which is hypnosis. We can define hypnosis as a social interaction involving two roles. Um, one person, which we call the subject, responds to suggestions given by another person, the hypnotist, for various kinds of imaginative experiences, all of which involve um, alterations in uh, conscious memory, perception, and the voluntary control of, of action. So hypnotic subjects can see things that aren't there, they can fail to see things that aren't, that, that are there, they can um, feel like they're children again, uh, they can come out of hypnosis and not remember the things that they did while they were hypnotized, and if the hypnotist has set this up beforehand in response to a cue, they can engage in various kinds of post-hypnotic suggestions without knowing what they're doing or, uh, or, uh, or why. These these phenomena of hypnosis also seem to entail alterations in conscious awareness and in the conscious control of action. This is, uh, this is what hypnosis looks like. It looks, this looks the, the, all the images you see on, um, on the internet don't look anything like hypnosis. It's a very prosaic kind of thing. This is Professor David Spiegel at Stanford University, one of the world's foremost authorities on clinical hypnosis demonstrating hypnosis in, a, um, in, a, in his office. And the subject has been given a suggestion that his arm will feel very light, as if it's been, uh, as if it, there are helium balloons attached to it, lifting, uh, lifting his arm up. And this, even such a prosaic suggestion as this, demonstrates the essential qualities of, no, of, of hypnosis, which is a loss of conscious, uh, the change in conscious awareness, and especially a loss of conscious control. There isn't, of course, a set of helium balloons lifting the person's uh, the hand up, um, uh, nor, is, no, nor for that matter is there any kind of magnetic force moving the person's hand up. He's doing this um, as, as a voluntary action, but he doesn't know that he's doing it as a voluntary action. This is experienced as a kind of compulsive uh, that, that, uh, behavior that kind of comes out of nowhere um, and as if it's being done by somebody else. Kind of all the uh, experiences associated with hypnosis have the same kind of quality. And for that reason, um, hypnosis has long been thought of as a potential laboratory model that we can use to study the mechanisms by which the clinical uh, symptoms of hysteria uh, take place. Again, uh, the, the phenomena of hypnosis bear a kind of phenotypic similarity to the symptoms of hysteria. They are disorders of consciousness, pseudo-neurological disorders of consciousness. They are functional as opposed to organic. Spiegel here hasn't uh, taken control of the person's uh, uh, frontal, uh, frontal motor area or anything uh, like that. They are, in a sense, psychogenic as opposed to somatogenic because all the phenomena of hypnosis begin with suggestion, with the transmission of an instruction or a suggestion or something like that from the hypnotist uh, to the subject. This idea 
that the phenomena of hypnosis, or that hypnosis itself, might be a laboratory model for hysteria also goes way back. This is a famous uh, painting, a clinical lesson at the Salle Petrier by French artist Philippe Brule, uh, and it's depicting Charcot demonstrating hypnosis in his clinic at the Salle Petrier Hospital uh, in Paris. Charcot had the idea that hysterical patients were particularly hypnotizable, and he also had the idea that hypnotizable people were particularly prone to hysteria. We know that that's not the case now. We've done those studies. There's no relationship between uh, hypnotizability and any form of, 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 uh, of mental illness. But Charcot was quite right that there are various dissociative phenomena in, uh, in hypnosis that look a little bit like, at least, the kinds of dissociative phenomena we see in classical uh, hysteria. Again, some of these phenomena involve perception. Uh, hypno hypnotic subjects can uh, uh, feel a significant reduction in uh, felt pain from a painful stimulus. You can suggest tactile anesthesia so they won't even feel uh, a touch on a part of their body. Uh, hypnotic blindness and deafness, uh, an inability to smell um, uh, uh, various smelly substances. Positive hallucinations, seeing somebody that's not there negative hallucinations, failing to notice something that, uh, that is there, kind of like visual neglect, if you will. Post-hypnotic amnesia, this difficulty of memory, has some of the, um, uh, has some of the uh, uh, features of uh, the dissociative amnesias that I described last time. Age regression, feeling like you're a child uh, again. And then, as in this uh, picture of, uh, of Professor Spiegel, uh, various kinds of um, phenomena having to do with voluntary action. Idiomotor suggestions of various kinds that a person will uh, engage in certain kinds of motor, uh, motor activities in response to suggestion, either a direct suggestion like Spiegel's that the arm is moving up all by itself, or what's known as a challenge suggestion. You can suggest to a subject that their outstretched arm is stiff like a, like a bar of iron and they won't be able to bend it and the subject will be unable to uh, bend it even in response to a challenge by the, uh, by the hypnotist. And then there are these post-hypnotic suggestions that, some, that, the, that the subject will engage in various kinds of activities um, after hypnosis has been uh, terminated, um, uh, even though he doesn't necessarily know what he's doing uh, or, uh, or why. So again, these are the kinds of phenomena that you see in hypnosis that, uh, that suggest that by understanding more about the mechanisms of, hypno of hypnosis, what it can do and what it can't do, how it works, how it doesn't work, um, we might understand a little bit more about these very rare syndromes known as, uh, known as hysteria. Since almost the beginning of uh, scientific or uh, clinical work on hypnosis, uh, people who think about hypnosis uh, have tended to, been, uh, to be divided into one of two camps, those who take a credulous view of, of hypnotic phenomena and those who take a more skeptical view. The credulous view is the traditional view. It's the one that's portrayed in movies, whether it's Mickey Mouse hypnotizing Minnie um, or Svengali hypnotizing Trilby uh, or, or whatever. The idea that hypnotic suggestions um, uh, instigate a mental state of affairs that are exactly the same as those that would be uh, caused by, um, by the actual state of affairs. So, for example, in, uh, it's been claimed that hypnotic blindness is just like not having eyes or being blindfolded or something like that, uh, not, not having any uh, visual, uh, visual uh, function at all. And it's been suggested that hypnotic, uh, post-hypnotic amnesia is really uh, very analogous to forgetting a kind of loss of memories uh, from storage. That's the credulous view. The skeptical view, on the other hand, uh, tends to see hypnosis as only uh, a kind of exaggerated form of role playing. That when a hypnotized subject says he can't see, what he's saying is, I know you don't want me to see, so I'm going to tell you I'm not seeing anything, but I really do. Or when the hypnotist suggests amnesia, the subject says, all right, I'll behave as if I can't remember anything, but I really do. Um, the subject acts as if the world is suggested uh, by, uh, 
by the hypnotist. And as I say, this kind of idea goes, uh, this kind of dichotomy in views of hypnosis goes way back, it goes back at least a century and a half uh, to the reception of a work, of work by uh, James Esdale, a Scottish physician who worked in India with the British, um, uh, British government uh, there. Uh, and one of the things that Esdale did was to pioneer the use of hypnotic suggestion as a kind of analgesic agent for use in surgery. Notice the date here, 1846. This is the before the, uh, the discovery of the, the first demonstration of chemical anesthesia uh, at Harvard by uh, W.T.G. Morton. Uh, so there wasn't anything to be done for surgical patients before then, except as far as Esdale was concerned, hypnosis. And what Esdale reported was that a large number of his surgical patients could, could uh, go through his surgical procedures without experiencing much or, or, or any, uh, much or any pain. And Esdale, even in 1846, said, look, there are two ways you can think about this. One is that the subjects are, that, that my patients are faking it. Uh, that, uh, so he, he, might, he asked his readers to imagine my patients returning home, say to their friends, my, my friend, I'm playing this amazing joke on this doctor. He took a scalpel to me and he cut out parts of my body and I made him believe that I wasn't feeling any pain. Why don't you go do the same thing? Okay, um, that's a kind of a representation of the skeptical view. Or uh, what Esdale thought was more likely, something closer to the credulous view, or they say to their fellow sufferers, look at me, I had this, ter this terrible tumor, the doctor took it out and I, did, uh, and I didn't feel any pain, go to him and he'll do the same thing uh, for you. On the one side, patients are acting as if they don't feel pain. On the other side, the patients are acting as if they really don't uh, feel, um, feel any pain. There is um, a, a, a kind of interesting feature uh, here. If you had a brain damaged patient, a patient with damage to, say, the anterior cingulate gyrus who went through surgery and said, I didn't experience any pain, you wouldn't give that a second thought. If we had a patient like HM who had bilateral damage to the hippocampus and he told you that he couldn't remember anything, you wouldn't give that a second thought. Most people wouldn't. Nobody ever questioned whether HM was faking his amnesia all, all these years. But this question does arise with, with respect to both uh, patients with dissociative disorders of various kinds and normal subjects who were hypnotized, leading to what I've liked to call the irony of self-reports, which after 40 years in this business, I can tell you, you encounter almost every day, which is that all too many psychologists are, only, uh, are inclined to believe self-reports only when they come from people with brain damage, okay? If a brain damaged person says, I can't remember or I can't see, say, oh, I'm really sorry about that. If a non-brain damaged patient, a, a subject says to you, I can't remember or I can't see, what the, your, the, the immediate uh, impulse is to think that he or she is, uh, is faking it. The credulous and the skeptical views of hypnosis, however, don't exhaust the possibilities. Um, there, is a, there is a third way to think about this, a way that, um, uh, that was anticipated by an Australian psychologist, J.P. Sutcliffe, uh, more, than, uh, more than 50 years ago, which is to say that the hypnotized subjects are deluded. They have a, uh, an erroneous belief about what is going on with them, which is to say that hypnotic 